Hey, are you a good writer? Do you love this podcast, This Week in Startups? I know you do. You're here. Well, do you like to work from home and do you like money? Do you want a job working from home listening to the sound of my voice? Now, if you say no, that's fine. It's a reasonable thing to say. But if you love the pod, we are looking for the first twist archivist. This is a writer's job, and the job is going to be to go through the first thousand episodes, manage the transcription service that transcribes everything, write blog posts, and listen to a podcast or two a day from our archive, and then reflect on how awesome it was and what the guests said and what are the insights gleaned from it. And we want you to be that archivist who says, oh my God, there was this amazing moment in Travis's episode uh, from Uber or Chris Saka's famous episode or maybe the founder of Pixar said something brilliant and then you make a blog post out of it and you write about it and you share it with the community so more people can get into that archive. This is a full-time paid job working from home on the startup podcast that you love this week in startups. So if you want to apply and you want to join the team, it's pretty simple. You go to twistarchivist.com, T-W-I-S-T-A-R-C-H-I-V-I-S-T.com, and just fill out the form and apply. We're going to have you listen to an episode and write up a blog post about it. Uh, we'll have you actually do it. And uh, if you do a great job, this could be your dream job, especially if you're trying to get into the startup ecosystem. Imagine you do this for a year or two, maybe three, and you listen to all the episodes and you think about how to start a company, you are going to become brilliant. And that's why I started the podcast. I wanted to share the knowledge that all these great founders and investors I knew had, and journalists too. And I wanted to share that with a community of like-minded people, and here we are. Ten years later, over a thousand episodes, we need somebody to go make sense out of this archive, and maybe that's you. Twistarchivist.com and fill out the form. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Gusto is easy online payroll, benefits, and HR built for the modern small business. Get three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash twist. LinkedIn. To redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. And The Meeting Owl Pro by Owl Labs. A 360-degree smart video conferencing camera that's revolutionizing how companies collaborate. To get $50 off your first Meeting Owl, Visit owllabs.com slash twist, then use offer code twist at checkout. Thanks for tuning in to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And if you're listening, you're either an investor, a founder, or you're considering being one of those two things at some point in your life. One of the hardest things to do in this world is to be the CEO of a company. Why is it so hard? Well, you have the weight of the world on your shoulders and the knowledge that seven out of 10 times, startups fail. And they fail hard. And it's brutal on the founder because the founder has gone out in the world, put themselves at risk and told everybody, I'm going to change the world through this startup by creating this product or service and I'm going to complete this mission. And you convince investors and you convince yourself and you convince your friends and your family, perhaps your spouse, your parents and a ton of employees to go on this crazy journey with you. And then you crash and burn. And it is brutal. And sadly, it throws people into depression. It throws people into anxiety. And so what's the solution to this? Well, the solution to this is to talk to people and to realize you're not alone in this journey, in these feelings. This is common. The good news is, like a video game, if you fail, you can just start again. At least here in America, the cost of failure is that you earn the right to try again. But that doesn't help people in the moment. That doesn't help imposter syndrome. It doesn't help anxiety. It doesn't help the grinding of the teeth that you yourself may have experienced, staring at the, staring at the ceiling every night going, am I going to run out of money? Are people going to think I'm a fraud? Am I going to embarrass myself in front of the world? Well, Matt is here. Moshari, I got it right? Got it right. Welcome to the program. Matt Moshari is the second coach to ever appear on This Week in Startups. Jerry Colonna was on the pod. And I love talking to coaches. Um, Alex McCaw from Clearbit was on episode 996. And uh, he mentioned you. And he said he had a big unlock. He said he didn't know what he was doing. He felt a little uh, lost. And you coached him. When did you become a coach? And why did you decide to become one? Great question. So I've been an investor. 
I was a partner in an investment firm here in the, in the Valley. And then I became a founder myself and I started a company. I sold it about 18 years ago. Um, so I've been on both sides of the coin. Um, and then I took a bunch of time off just because my I monetized and, and didn't need to make more money. And uh, moved to Brazil and New York and then and eventually ended up coming back to Silicon Valley and realized that I wanted to sort of get connected to the community again, but I didn't want to start another company because the result of starting another company is one, it results in more money, which I didn't need or want. Um, and two, it's a lot of work, which I also didn't need or want. So I thought to myself, how can I connect into the, into the ecosystem, but only do the fun part? And I thought, well, wait a second. If I just coach, that's all the fun part and that's none of the work. So let's see if I can do that. Hmm. But I also assumed I'm not a coach. So therefore, who's going to want me to coach them? Well, it's only the people that no one else will coach. And so who will no one coach? Well, no one will coach students while they're still students at university. Hmm. So YC famously will not accept students into the, into the YC cohort. So I went on to Stanford campus. A guy named Chris Barber, who was then a student, uh, invited me on. He said, listen, I've got five roommates. They've all started companies. They're all real businesses. Uh, but no one will coach them. Will you coach them? Hmm. And I said, okay, I'll try it. And so I did. And it was just super fun. It was everything I imagined. It was all the fun, none of the work. They did all the work, but they thanked me and gave me credit or part credit for all the success that they had. So that's really where it started. And is there some training you went through to coach or is it just the school of hard knocks and being a great listener? What makes a, for a great coach in your experience and now how long have you been doing it and how many people have you coached? So about six years, probably coached about, mm, let's call it a hundred people. Okay. Um, and the, um, so in terms of schooling, in terms of the business side, yeah. no, that's just my own experience. Right. In terms of the softer, I, I call that the hard skill side. Right. In tactical so, stuff. Exactly. In terms of both strategy and tactical implementation. Got it. And we can get into more detail High about what that High level means. and then on the ground. Exactly. And, uh, but then on the softer side, which is what you were talking about in your introduction about the the emotional awareness, the the depression, the anxiety, not acting on the fear and anger that appear, um, that I did take courses on. And I took, I sort of immersed myself in it. I took courses from Conscious Leadership and Hendricks Institute and uh, Coaches Training Workshop. I don't even remember what the name, Institute or something like that. And like uh, basically every course I could see and, and, and think of, and I just enjoyed it, I just sucked mm. it up because I had never had any awareness of that emotional side. And so I think that I, um, you know, there are different types of coaches. Hmm. Um, most, uh, so you either get that soft skill side or that hard skill side. Hmm. I, I may be one of the few that sort of blends both. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't really sort of look at what other people are doing, but I just sort of right. hear anecdotally. And in the, the tactical side, I think we get that. Mm -hmm. People give a lot of advice. There are mentors out there doing it. Yeah. And so I wouldn't say it's a commodity, but it's freely available. Yeah. Uh, it's even in blog posts, it's on podcasts, there's courses, et cetera. But the human side, the emotional side, that seems to be the big uh, need, the acute need from founders. They can ask other founders, how do I monetize my product? How do I get new customers? All that stuff's out there. What is the secret to being a great coach and what do most of your clients need? What are the common themes in other words? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that I see, and by the way, you mentioned that it's CEOs, so I coach both CEOs, but also heads of investment firms. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so um, Benchmark and Sequoia and, and General Catalyst and Felicis and and Well, uh, those and are the top notes. firms, why do they need coaches? Aren't they the big winners, Benchmark and Sequoia? How do they need coaching? Because they all want to get better. Ah. And they see- So even if you're at the top of your game, those are people who should get coaching or who will elect to get coaching to get even better. Well, they see how effective it is for their CEOs. Uh, so they've just gotten wise and said, well, I, I want some of that too. And, yeah. and they're taking it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the, so, the, so the big difference is, is that companies, CEOs know that they're running a company. Heads of investment firms grew up as investors and think of themselves as investors. Their first instinct is not, I'm running an organization. It's that I'm going out to find deals and make investments. Right. So there's actually, and there really aren't any books or blog posts written for how to run an investment firm. Plenty of books on how to run a company. Um, so the first, there's, a, there's much more low-hanging fruit in the investment firms. Ah. Um, just causing them to realize first that they are running an organization, whether they right. want to 
whether they want to do that or not. Um, on the CEO side, uh, and in any organization on both sides, what I find is, is that there is uh, fear is sort of, um, there is fear in the organization that the head of the organization may not see or realize. And that fear is causing team members not to give the head feedback on how that person can perform better or what the real problems in the company are. And then even more insidious, peers are not giving each other feedback. Like say, hey, JC, you know, you, you introduced me as a blank and I really wish you would have done it as, as the other. Right. And uh, if I never tell you that, then you're going to keep repeating that same action because I never gave you any feedback. Mm. But the th problem is, is that if you're my boss or if you're my peer and I don't have any, uh, you, if I say this to you, you might react negatively. Mm. You might get triggered because I might just say it and I don't know how you react to feedback. Right. And if you react negatively, now you hate me. And so that's like a minus 100. Right. And I have to live with you now in my career. Now I've got a peer who hates me or even worse, a boss who hates me. Right. That could destroy my career. Right. Whereas if you do take it well, okay, then you no longer introduce me that way and maybe it's a positive one. So it's an asymmetric bet in the wrong direction. Right. So people just don't do it. They just don't say what they think or give feedback in any way or point out the negative. So these organizations are running blind. And that's the first thing that I do when I go into an org is, is to help the head of the org realize that if they're not getting feedback from their, if they're not hearing bad things, it means that their people are withholding. It doesn't it. mean that their company is perfect or they're perfect because that doesn't exist. It just means their people are afraid to say anything. And some managers like it that way, don't they? Oh, sure. Those they are not like, good managers. Can they be successful? If they learn to appreciate and want the feedback, yes. Got it. If they don't learn to do that, no. They can't be. No. So you can't just be a dictator and power your way to success. I've never seen it. Yeah. Uh, short term, perhaps? Yes. But not long term. Yes. Long term, you need to be open to feedback. Absolutely. People are scared to give feedback, if I'm understanding you correctly. So you have to give them explicit permission? Yes. You got to literally pull it out of them. And if you do... On first try, my experience is they will still not give it to you. Absolutely. So how does one get the truth? Do they use a mediator like yourself to go collect the information or these 360 reviews or type forms or forms that get filled out? How do you actually get people to get real? Yeah. So you can do use those steps. I, I don't like those steps. I prefer baby steps that's direct. Okay. So I prefer getting people in a room. And first of all, I will have people tell me, what they think really. And then I'll say, okay, but I'll ask, let's say we have an exec team. I'll talk to all eight of the exec team members. You all tell me what the issues are. They open up to me because I'm going to anonymize this. I then say, okay, now I'm going to show you how this works. Let's test. Let's see if the CEO can handle this, how they react to the feedback. And then I give them the feedback, but this is all live in a room. And either the, feed, the CEO you know, gets angry or the CEO goes, wow, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I accept that, and now I'm going to take the following action. And once the team can see that the CEO took the feedback well, then I say, okay, now you try. And I point to someone in the room, and, and they start giving direct feedback, and the CEO takes that well too. Now we start to have a, a, a loop that mm. continues, that has momentum, and people then start to get into it, and they see just how far they can go. But of course, once someone is good at accepting feedback, the more feedback you give them, the more they like it. What, what feedback is worth getting and what feedback is like, um, let's just say- Complaining, victim. Yeah, like complaining, whining, yeah. not productive. I, you know, there we should have another type of milk in the refrigerator, seventh type of milk. Because I know that in my career, I've always been, you know, a very, um, let's say, brusque uh, leader. Like, let's be serious and do the work. And I really don't like discussing nonsense. I like to discuss like the the card of the issue. I can take feedback, but I want to focus on what matters. Right? How As do you, you should. keep it be from becoming like the the complain fest, the whining fest? Because that is a risk, isn't it? Of course, yeah. absolutely. It's a great question. So it can't be that if I give you feedback, you must accept it. Hmm. That would create tyranny of the feedback giver. And tyranny the, of the feedback giver. I love it. <laughs> and that is not allowed. Right. So. 
first, I just, I'm going to appreciate you giving me feedback at all. I'm right. just going to thank you for it. Yeah. Thanks for that. Then I'm going to repeat it back just to make sure I understood it. And that's right. actually probably the most important part is Reflecting acknowledging it. it. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. that you know, I actually heard you. And then third, I'll declare whether or not I actually accept it. And I may not. This is right. the only part of the process that's optional. But if I do accept it, then I'll tell you what action I'll take to satisfy mm. it. But there's no requirement to accept it. If you tell me, here's, here's an, a real example. Um, in this past two years, I gained probably 60 pounds just because I decided I want to, I care about today. I don't give a shit about, you know, some mythical future. And, uh, and so I'm just going to enjoy myself right now. And I'll, I become very close with the people I coach and they, they want me to be around forever. Right. And they felt fear and they thought, right. oh my God, Matt might die early. Right. And so I got from many people, I got the feedback, Matt, I really wish you would eat healthier and live healthier. And I said, I appreciate it. I think you told me that you want me to eat healthier and live healthier. They said, yes, that's exactly right. Great. I acknowledge it. Third, I do not accept it. And the reason I don't accept it is because this is actually a conscious choice on my part. And again, I don't believe in this mythical future. I believe in today. So I'm not going to act on it. And I go, they went, okay. We gave the feedback. You heard us. And we were fine that you don't accept it. And they now have a choice of accepting that you heard them. So at least they feel heard. So That's now right. you've relieved the burden of them not saying something. That's right. That's right. Um, but they don't get to control your destiny. Exactly. All right, when we get back from this quick break, I want to talk about fear. Because it seems to me that one of the jobs of leadership is balancing what I would call healthy fear and paralyzing fear. Yes. And when we get back, I just want to dive into when fear increases performance and when it freezes performance on This Week in Startups. Small business owners wear a lot of hats. You know this, I know this, because we are wearing all those hats right now. Well, Gusto makes payroll, taxes, and HR easy for small businesses with fast and simple payroll processing, benefits, expert HR support, all in one place. They automatically pay and file federal, state, and local taxes for you. And it's easy to add health benefits and 401k programs. If you're generous, three of four customers take 10 minutes or less to run a payroll with Gusto. You must, though, go to Gusto. We use it. I literally use and love Gusto. It is the best product out there for this purpose. It's quick and easy onboarding of new employees. That's critical. And persistent and helpful communication, but never annoying. They make sure you stay on top of it, but they're not annoying. And they have unbelievably great customer service over chat and phone. I know this because my team is on the phone and chatting with, well, mostly chatting to be honest, because it's more efficient. Uh, but if you want to pick up the phone, you can get a human. That's a good thing. And uh, they solve every problem really quick. It's great to have payroll and benefits in one place. And we do things like commuter, health, dental, vision, 401k, 529. If you got kids who are going to school, HSA, all this great stuff. And now is the best time for you to set up 2020 and beyond. Don't wait. Start your next decade with Gusto and get three months free when you run your first payroll. That is extremely generous. Thank you, Gusto. Gusto, you must -o. go to Gusto. You know that. G-U-S-T-O dot com slash twist. That's G-U-S-T-O dot com slash twist. Thank you for Augusto uh, for supporting this podcast and for helping me get my payroll and benefits done. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Matt Mashari is here with us. He is a CEO investor coach. Um, and he's been doing that for about six years. He's the author of The Great CEO Within. And uh, Alex McCaw told us about him, uh, episode 996. He is the um, founder of Clearbit. And as you know, we had Jerry Colonna on episodes 944 and 945. He was also on five years before that. You know Jerry? I don't. I know oh, okay. of him, of you course. You know of him, of yeah. course, yeah. Um, let's talk about fear. Yep, great. And when, how should a leader or an investor think about the value of fear, healthy fear, motivating fear, versus paralyzing fear? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Because these are two different things, aren't they? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Um, so I want to go down two different alleyways on this. Um, we'll start with one. I think it's not just investors and CEOs. 
in founders. It's all humans. Humans. Um, we all are, humans we are should, fearful. We absolutely, but that's kept us alive. Yeah. And so we. It's a feature, not a bug. Exactly. And, uh, and so, um, you know, Sapolsky wrote this book called Behave, which goes deep into the physiology of the brain mm. and where emotions come from and thought patterns and creativity and fear, et cetera. And so I'm not going to try to recreate that. If you, you know, if anyone listening has interest, they should read that book or watch the videos that he has, which are phenomenal. And, uh, but he basically describes the, the brain as the prefrontal co uh, uh, cortex, the hypothalamus and the uh, hypothalamus and the, um, the amygdala. Um, so just make it real basic. Our creative thought occurs primarily in our prefrontal cortex and fear and anger and thoughts associated with it occur in our amygdala. And amygdala is basically called our reptile brain. It's, it's where when we go into fear and anger, the, basically the only thoughts we have are fight or flight. Am I going to destroy this threat by killing it? Or am I going to run away from this threat and avoid it? Um, and those are obviously very limiting thoughts. Yeah. Um, and so we don't, the, the challenge is to notice when those are the kinds of thoughts we're having and recognize, oh, I'm in my amygdala. That's really, it's a primitive brain. These are not my best thoughts. And basically not to act on those thoughts uh, because they're so limiting. Um, once fear and anger pass, my thought processes go back into my prefrontal cortex. And now I see all kinds of possibilities and solutions. Those are the thoughts I want to act on. Now, of course, it's very difficult to know when I'm in the amygdala state. You can do lots of meditation and sort of do a lot of practice on how to recognize when I'm feeling fear and anger. Or my preferred solution is just literally empower the people around me. Say, hey, if you ever notice me in fear or anger, just let me know. Just say mm. fear, anger, and I'll know exactly what you're talking about. And then I'll just stop. I won't, I won't act mm. until it passes. Um, so that's, that's one thing to think. The second thing is, is that fear itself is a healthy response to an unknown situation where there is risk involved. So that, it's simply cautioning us to operate with care. The problem is our amygdala is so powerful that it is trying to prevent us from do anything at all. Because um, if we do nothing, we won't die. If we mm -hmm. don't eat that poisonous berry, if we don't go into that dark cave, the you know the saber tooth tiger won't eat us. This is all from millions of years ago. This is programmed into our bodies, into our brainstem, into our spinal cord. I mean, this is the core operating system: is paralyze yourself to survive. That's exactly right. Yeah. And a million years ago, a hundred thousand years ago, that was a very good idea and a very wise yeah. move. Today, it just has tremendous opportunity cost. So, especially in business, I mean, freezing is the worst thing you can do. You have to take action. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So what our brain does is our brain tries to reinforce, tries to get us, trick us to not do anything. So it creates thoughts hmm. that are very powerful and seem very real, which say, if you do this, it predicts consequences that are dire. Like in the example I gave before, if I give you feedback, hey, Jason, you introduced me that way. I didn't like it. I'm predicting that you're going to get pissed off and hate me and then spend the rest of your life trying to destroy me. Obviously, that's an insane thought, but that's the thought that occurs to people when they're actually in a crisis or fear situation. It might have been a rational thought if you knew me when I was 30. Fair enough. Because I did, <laughs> I did have an approach of destroying people. Well, that was a slightly different thing. But it is interesting, the, the ability to pause when in fear or when in a fearful or a, let's just call it intense situation. That is something that you can curate. You can you can work on. Absolutely. And I, you know, having worked on an ambulance, you pull up, and the immediate sense of dread. When I was working on the ambulance in Brooklyn, led me to with the people I worked with would go into, like this incredible Jedi samurai mode where we were just all business. We would walk in. We'd open, we'd knock on the door, we'd go inside, there'd be somebody laying on the ground and there wasn't the ability to be scared. You had to take action because if this was an asthma attack or a heart attack, we were talking about a minute or two. I always felt like that prepared me for entrepreneurship. Are there ways for people to become good at, let's say, 
embracing the fear, embracing the moment and knowing if this is an intense, fearful moment, it's an opportunity to deploy skills and to grow and, and to win. Because whenever I'm in that scarce situation, like companies are running out of money, I look at it and say, this is when I do my best work. This yeah. is when I can be of service as an investor or when I'm a founder. Right. Every time I've been backed into a corner, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm built for. I tell myself that in my mind. That's my mantra. I'm built for this situation. Yeah. Well, well, and I've deluded myself into thinking that. No, it's not a delusion. I think that's right. Yeah. And so you've had the benefit of having lots and lots of iterations on fear, still need to move forward anyway, yeah. can't turn around and run away. No. Forced into the situation yeah. and then see the result. Right. And then realize, oh, it was fine. Yeah. Then it happens again. Next call. Fear. Go to the apartment in Brooklyn. Oh, my God. Forced into the situation. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. So you, you're very fortunate. That's a very rare situation that people are forced to go through that loop. But that is the answer for getting out of the fear-based loop, is to, is to have someone or something force you to say, okay, you predict that if you do that, this dire thing will happen. Okay, do that thing anyway. And then when you do that thing anyway, nothing terrible happens. You go, oh, shoot, my fear gave me bad advice. Yeah. And that's what breaks the cycle. So what I do when I'm coaching folks is whenever I see them in that situation, I make a bet with them. And I try to take, we try to pick a situation that's not, doesn't have such dire consequences. Right. But um, something that's sort of low level we start with. Mm. And they think if they do X, then A will happen, which is terrible. And I say, okay, I think B will happen, which is the exact opposite and which is great. And so we'll make a bet. And But I say, but if I win, then you've got to listen to me from now on whenever I say you're in fear. Yeah. And I've made this bet, I don't know, 50, 60 times. I've won every time. Yeah. But it's it's not hard. Yeah. And so if you ever do think you're in fear, another thing to do is just go talk to somebody else who's not emotionally wrapped up in the situation and trust whatever their brain says. Right. Because they're not vested in it. That's right. Right. So if you if if you said, I'm walk if you called another EMT and said, I'm going into a room, there's a cardiac arrest. They'd say, okay, step one, check the airway. Step two, check the breathing. Step three, check the circulation. And then act from there, you know the protocol. That's right. You'd be like, okay, great. And now I'm diffused. Even just saying it out loud, I'm diffused. It's diffused the, the fear for me in that situation. And in the first couple of times, I will say, oh, it's scary as hell to do CPR on a dead person. Yeah. Like a person you know is not coming back and you do CPR on them for 20 or 30 minutes. It is terrifying. Until you realize like, I did the best I could, That's right. right? That's right. And there's something about, I think, and I don't know if it correlates with your experience, but the act of going through the fear that kind of makes you as an individual, right? I always feel like my big advantage when working as an investor with founders is I made it through 2001. I watched the Twin Towers fall. I made it through 2008. I made it to, through the dot-com bust of 2000. I made it through the crash of 1987. I've been through so many of these unbelievably brutal moments in business and life and tragedies that running out of money in a company and not missing payroll or having to lay off the staff, it doesn't actually move my pulse all that much. Right. Life goes on. It always goes on. And you know, when you gave that example of you think A is going to happen, B is going to happen, the first thing that came to my mind, and I'm curious what examples you used in those 60 times was when a founder has to fire their co-founder or somebody. They always think it's gonna be the worst experience of their life. And almost universally, they go in and say, listen, it's not working out. And the person says, I, I, I was thinking about leaving anyway. And That's I exactly agree. Right. And they're like, oh, wait, <laughs> this is a relief for you too? That's right. You were gonna leave? Oh my God, let's work this out. Yeah, good luck in your next company. Yep, that's it. It's almost universally that. Absolutely. What other situations have you had that happen? It's almost always with, uh, you, that's the big one where people are too scared to move. So we have to go to a lower level one, uh. which is there's X employee in the company who's l much lower down. Mm. And I'm also having you know strife and conflict with that person. Right. Let's start with that person. Yeah. And then again, the results for that person as well are, yeah, I'm not happy here either. Right. And I'm glad you noticed. Thanks for, for pointing it out. Great, let me find a, a place. Let me help you find a place that is better for you. Right. And it yeah. always works out well. Uh, when we get back from this quick break, I want to get into imposter syndrome. This seems to be something that all founders go through. And I even see it 
after they win the prize, they get the brass ring, they sell their company, they get the money, you did this. And they still feel like they got lucky, they can't manifest it again. I wanna know how often people that you coach have imposter syndrome and what's the methodology for letting them sort of release that tension when you get back on the team startups. Listen, time and place is everything. You know this, and especially in marketing, right? Location and time matters. But in today's age, when people are getting a million messages per minute, how do you catch people's attention? Well, with over 62 million decision makers on LinkedIn, LinkedIn ads make sure your messages get through to the most relevant people because they know job titles, location, the size of companies. It's not just about awareness. LinkedIn ads are driving traffic and engagement, such as visits to a landing page. So this isn't just to get your name out there. This is to get an action, right? To get people to come to your landing page so with precise targeting. SMBs, small and medium-sized businesses, which include startups, can speak to the people that matter and not waste your ad budget on people who don't. LinkedIn ads are helping smaller businesses get massive results. And here's a video of our marketing manager, Marine, creating an open office hours lead gen campaign. So she sets the company size since we're trying to get small companies, emerging companies, right? And she sets the title. You know what we want. We want founders and co-founders, of course. And after the targeting is all set, she creates the copy, the creative, and links it to a custom lead form. And within minutes, the campaign is up and running. So here is your call to action. I can't believe it. My friends at LinkedIn Marketing are doing it again. LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups for $100 in LinkedIn ad credits uh, when you launch your first campaign. Terms and conditions apply because they're giving you 100 bucks. Obviously, it's a big, generous offer. And I just want to say to the LinkedIn team, especially the marketing team, thanks for supporting uh, independent media like This Week in Startups. It means a lot to us and the listeners. And thanks for the hundy. I mean, everybody could use a hundy and everybody needs a little marketing, some more customers. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, my guest is Matt Moshari. Moshari, M-O-C-H-A-R-Y. He's the author of The Great CEO Within. How many people do you coach concurrently? Dozen, two dozen? No, right now about 20 CEOs and about five investors. Okay, so 25. 25, which is a lot. That does seem like a lot. You meet them weekly, monthly, bi-weekly? That's a good question. Twice a month? Staged. Um, okay. So I try to meet them four times quickly up in the beginning. Uh, and the reason is because when I coach In someone, a month? Uh, oh, no, four I, times in a short period of time. I try to do it ideally once a week. Got it. Um, and the reason is, is because when I coach someone, I tell them that there are a lot of people that report to you. Huh. You don't report to anybody. Yeah, you report to your board, or if you're the head of an investment firm, you report to your LPs, but not really. They're not holding you accountable. No, and they're so, checking in. Exactly. Um, but your people that report to you perform better because of the fact that they report to you. Hmm. So now you report to me. Got it. And if after four times meeting, you feel more empowered, more successful, more engaged, more just everything positive, then you know that my system works, and hmm. then you can just literally copy it. It's all written out. And you can paste it and use it with your direct reports. So instantly there's a system that they can use if they like it. Um, and then we do things beyond that. But that's sort of like the core. Um, that's like 80% of the value is right there in the first four meetings. My, my intention is not to be a dependent or mm. create a dependency. I like just to help people and then that's it. And after that, we're friends. Interesting. And then what is the ongoing maintenance like? Texting, calling, walk and talks, have a lunch? What? How, how, what works best? So for me, I forget everything within six seconds of saying it. Yeah. So I have to write things down. So for right. me, there's always a doc that we share. Uh. And therefore, unfortunately, it's not a walk around. It's yeah. sitting down either on a, a video call or in person. Video call actually usually works a little bit better uh, huh. because it focuses more on the doc itself. Ah. Whereas so in you, person- wait, So you open up a doc. What is this? A master plan of- how to succeed and, and how to manage yourself? It's sort of, yeah, it's got three sections to it. First is, you know, where are you trying to get to and what steps you're going to take to get there? And then from our last session, did you actually do those steps? Huh. So that's what I call accountability. Wow. Second piece is now what problems have you run into? Okay. And so let's unpack those issues and let's come up with an action plan. Got it. And then the third part is, how can I be better? We talked about feedback. Hmm. I do feedback in every single meeting I have, whether it's one-on-one -on -one group doesn't matter whether it's one person or a thousand people. Um, and so I model the feedback, both giving and receiving. Hmm. So we just give each other feedback at the end. Let's talk about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And then after the other break, let's do it together. 
Let's Great. have you mentor me and do the Done. three doc. Would love to. After the next break. But imposter syndrome. Is that a real thing? Does everybody feel it? Are some people delusional and immune from it? How often does it come up and how do you manage it with your uh, clients? Yeah. Um, almost everyone experiences it. I've known maybe a small handful of people that don't and they scare me. I um, think they're sociopathic or like they lack a, a self-awareness or something, delusional. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I, I kind of get that from some people. And now there's two ways. To, there, there's those that are, I guess what I mean, the few that I've known that haven't had it from birth. Right. Whereas those who sort of get to that place through sort of consciousness training, those are fine. Hmm. Um, but it's the ones who grew up without that imposter syndrome that scare yeah. me. Um, but imposter syndrome is simply that um, it, it comes from our childhood. Right. It comes from um, oftentimes the firstborn has it more than others. Um, because the firstborn, oddly, um, almost everything gets created in our childhood, and it's from traumas, but those traumas aren't necessarily negative. So typically, imposter syndrome comes from, um, I'm the firstborn, I, my parents got really excited when I walked, so they cheered. They got really excited when I talked, so they cheered. They got really excited when I had my first bite of food, so they cheered. So I learned to really enjoy those cheering moments. Yeah. So now I seek achievement and I constantly feel that I'm less than unless I'm ex in the moment of experiencing an achievement and a reward, mm. et cetera, that dopamine. But the vast majority of the time, I'm not experiencing some public reward and therefore I'm feeling less than. Mm. And um, this is a voice in our head. And frankly, it, it's very effective in, in moving us forward. It causes us to work hard. It causes us to learn. This is a little bit related to the, the healthy part of fear, yeah. the motivating part of fear. The problem is that it eats us alive inside and it allows, and it makes it that we can't actually enjoy the life that we're building, neither in the present nor in the future. And so, um, unfortunately, I just don't think that it's, it may be good temporarily for the company you're building. It's not good for the individual. Mm. And I find that replacing that, first recognizing there, the, 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 excuse me, that there is this voice, mm. that's the first step in going, you, you'll never get rid of the voice, but at least if you recognize it and where it came from, when you hear it, you can go, oh, I hear your voice. Thank you very much. I don't need you anymore. I'm right. going to move on. That's sort of step one in the in the healing process. And, uh, and then the step two is starting to re replace all the actions I do that I don't enjoy, but I think I have to do them with things that truly energize me. Because as a CEO or a head of investment firm, there's... 20 things that need to get done by my sort of my role, but it doesn't mean that I have to do them. This is so accurate. It just means that I have to make sure that it gets done by somebody. Right. And if I don't love doing it, I'm sure almost positive there's someone within the organization who does love doing it. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if I don't love doing it, I'm not going to be great at it. Yeah. And the person who does love doing it will actually be great at it. So it's taking sort of a, an audit of what I love and what I don't love and then mapping what I don't love to someone so who does. interesting that you bring this up because I did this a couple of years ago because I, you know, you start to make a little bit of money and you're, you know, I was very driven by not, I had a fear, an irrational fear of not having money because we ran out of money when I was a kid. And it was very traumatizing for me as a young person to just constantly be running out of money and not knowing if we could go back to school or college we paid for groceries, we lose the house, all that kind of stuff. And then once you start, you know, you, the dog catches the car, you're like, oh, okay, now what? And I looked at all the things involved as an investor and I was like, I really don't like talking to lawyers. Nothing personal. I love my lawyers, Wilson Sonsini, Fenwick, I love y'all. But going through the documents and going through these details and signing the documents, and then I deputized somebody in our organization, Ashley, and she's incredible at it. She's like one of the most amazingly organized people I know. And I just said, I trust you. Here's the, just the standard documents we want to do. And I also don't like negotiating with people over things that make no difference in the ultimate outcome. You know about these like negotiations that mean nothing. It's incredibly frustrating to negotiate over something that's meaningless. So I said, I don't want to ever negotiate with anybody again. Will you just talk to everybody and just tell them this is the standard deal? And then if they want to change it, you'll go to Jason, but it's probably better that we just resolve it ourselves. And I haven't had to read documents or negotiate anything. 
except maybe once a month something comes up and people are at a roadblock and I'm just like, Ashley, what do you think? She tells me what she thinks and I say, let's go with that. Because it's a coin toss anyway. Exactly right. And that is so freeing when you examine the things you don't like and remove them from your life. And then you find somebody who does love doing them. Oh my Lord, what an unlock. Mm -hmm. And that's part of being a coach, right? Is yes. letting people know what their superpower is and what actually is dragging them down. Yes. Well, as a coach, I can't tell them what their superpower is, but forcing them to go through the question. Inventory it. Exactly. Yeah, you got to inventory it. All right. Is there a generational difference in coaching a millennial versus a Gen Xer versus a boomer? You must have had time with each of them. It seems to me, having worked with folks, the millennial generation, the Gen X, I mean, you're in a self-selecting group of CEOs and investors, so that does change things. But I do very acutely see a different motivation between the Gen X and millennials, where the Gen Xers want success and the millennials want purpose. And is that an evolution uh, that's happened in our society here in America that is noble and important? Or are we losing our edge because we're not as rabid capitalists as we once were? And can you remind me again about the age groups we're talking about? Because I don't- So Gen X would be born uh, before 1990, like 85 or before, okay. probably our age, like 40s, okay. 50s. Boomers would be over 60 and millennials would be under 35 right now. Great. Yeah. Well, the reality is most of the people I coach are millennials then. Yeah. Um, and so I may not have as much for perspective. I don't yeah. coach any- Boomers, any right? In their but 60s. some Gen Xers, some thirty-five some, yeah. to fifty-year-olds, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the there is this among the millennials. So again, rather than notice the differences, I'll talk about the 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 purpose driven of the millennials. Yeah. And yes, that's absolutely absolutely is there. I, I don't think it necessarily matters whether it's success driven or purpose driven. Whatever the the pull is, the carrot yeah. that gets people to engage in an activity until there's enough momentum that they're actually passionate about it. Mm. I think that's all that really matters. Right. Um, frankly, purpose is, I think, we delude ourselves that we're making the world a better place. The world just is. And you know whether there's a better iPhone or not does not make the world a better place. Yeah. And even those who are, you know, I actually, I help ex-convicts get and keep a legitimate job because I think that the mass incarceration in this country is is an economic issue and nothing else. Hmm. And But even I don't delude myself that I'm making the world a better place. Um, You're I, making those individuals' world a better place. Yes, fair enough. For them. For them. But that's not even why I do it. I right. do it because I enjoy it. It ah. gives me energy. Why? Um, what is it about you that got you there? Is there something in your childhood? Uh, no, actually the exact opposite. I grew up in a wealthy neighborhood and, and I grew up thinking that, uh, and by the way, this is in my foundation, the Mashari foundation. Yeah. Um, I thought that, um, I grew up thinking that all, uh, convicts are, are guilty and that, um, ah. they're sociopaths because anybody can get a job at McDonald's. So you had a stigma. Sure. And I think yeah. that's a very common, uh, view. Sure. And, uh, and it was just coincidence that yeah. after I sold my first company, I needed something to do. And, uh, and so I decided I was going to go make a movie, um, just because that seemed like it was challenging and fun. Yeah. And, uh, and so I decided I took a little film course and I decided, well, I'll go make a documentary in, in Brazil. Cause I want to learn about Brazil right. and who wouldn't. And, uh, and so I went down there and the, the big thing there is that, you know, in Rio, the, the slum, the worst slums are literally right on top of the wealthiest neighborhoods yep. right on the beach. And so I made a movie about these slums and I spent a lot of time in, in the, about a year in the slums and I realized, oh my God, there are no schools here. And so you, the kids don't have any skills. They can't get a job. So they still have to eat. So the only thing they can do is join their drug gang so that they can make money to eat. Um, well, thank God I live in a country where there's public schools everywhere. Yeah. So that's not the case in my country. So I came back to New York, made a second film, this one on uh, amateur boxing, which it turns out he heavyweight boxing, turns out the best amateur heavyweight boxers all live in the South Bronx. They basically congregate there so they can train yeah. against each other. And so I spent, and that's also one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York. I ended up spending a bunch of time there and realizing, oh my God, there are schools here, but they're so bad, they might as well not exist. Wow. And again, if I had been born in this neighborhood, I would join the drug gang as well. 
Right. And then I thought, oh my God, is it possible that everything I've thought is completely untrue? That right. guys who commit crimes are actually just acting rationally. They're just trying to survive. Yeah. So if that were true, then I know this is going way off course from no, my coaching. No, no, this but, is incredible. <laughs> right on. This so is what I, the show is about is tangents. Okay, The best right stuff on. happens in the tangents, <laughs> right as on. you know. Right, it's true. And so I said, well, is it possible that uh, if I took the hardest core criminal and taught him how to get and keep a legitimate job, would he? And I thought about it for a little while. I thought, well, wait a second. That doesn't sound like a fun thing to do. And what if I'm wrong? Yeah. And what if I'm then dealing with a you know a, a known killer in, in my presence? Who you've invited into your life and exactly. you've tried to basically do an intervention with. Exactly. Yeah, now you're in it. Exactly. But I also had the thought that who else at 30 years old is independently wealthy, has lived in two of the worst slums in the world, and is available. Right. There's nobody else. So right. if I don't do it, who will? Yeah. So I did. I went to I went to Rikers Island and I, I talked to the warden there and said, listen, I want one of your hardcore guys that's getting out. And he laughed and said, they're all hardcore. And so he en ended up introducing me to one. And, and turns out I went through this experiment. I taught the guy how to, he looked like a thug, act like a thug, talked like a thug. And I taught him how to dress like me, talk like me, act like me, and instantly got a job. But two weeks later, he lost it. Because they did the background check, had a criminal background, said, ah, we can't keep you. And that went through several cycles. And after about six jobs like this, we realized, oh, wait a second. We've got to get you a job where they don't care that you have a criminal record. Mm. And it turns out there's very few of those. Right. It's only skill-based jobs where there's a massive shortage of the skill itself. Mm. So if you show up with the skill, there's no other applicant. I don't care whether you've murdered somebody, you get the job. Plumber. Exactly. It's the construction trades and it's truck driving, having a commercial truck driving license. Right. It turns out that truck driving is easier to teach. The The construction trades is, is an apprentice trade, which I wasn't able to yeah. do, but I could pay for a guy to go to trucking school. So that's what we ended up, I ended up doing. And, uh, and now I, it cost me about 4,000 bucks uh, to train a guy to become a truck driver. And once he it takes about 60 days and once he's got that, he then is making starting salary, 50 grand. And within three years, he's usually making a hundred grand. And after that, all the problems disappear. And so um, I do this together with Jason Green from Emergence Capital and Andy Bromberg. Uh, we've created something called Join Free World run by a guy named Jason Wang. Huh. This year we trained about 80 guys, um, uh, that 19, 2019, 2020, we'll probably train about 300 guys. And so far we've only had one guy go back to prison. And that was very temporary. He, he already got out again. Amazing. Yeah, so it works. And for you- I have no idea how we got on that subject, but I'm glad. No, I, I mean, Talking about purpose, I think, is what got us there. And, you know, you talked a little bit about whatever the motivation is. You, in order to succeed in the pursuits that you're coaching, a requirement is the resiliency um, and the motivation, that, that sort of combination of the resiliency to not give up when things get hard and the motivation to do your best work in a, in a very dynamic, hard you know, area. I mean, and if you are not truly motivated, like being a, an athlete or a musician, like you have to want it. Yes. Yes. You, you can't make somebody want it, can you? No. No. Except that you can take, well, people want it, but again, do they want the, they want to avoid the absence of it or do they want the thing itself? Mm. I think most people that I encounter anyway, their motivation is fear. Their motivation is fear of failure, yeah. fear, of not, fear of not having the money like you right. described, fear of not being viewed as successful, fear of not being liked. So it's a negative motivation, which is very powerful. What I try to do, though, is change that into a joy-based motivation, right. which is, I think, equally <clears throat> powerful, but much more enjoyable along the way. And the short-term fear um, is a very base level, like competition- fear, these things are base. Absolutely. They will motivate you without having to think too much. But to get to purpose, to get to joy, requires some effort, does it not? It requires some Absolutely. enlightenment. Absolutely. And it takes time too. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's two ways I think to get to joy. One is is the direct approach saying, well, what makes you happy and try to go do that? Yeah. Unfortunately, I've never found success during that, do, going down that road. Huh. Because most people, I don't think, we don't really know what makes us happy. Why not? 
Well, I don't know. Yeah. But the other route I've gone down has turned out to be very successful. And that is what we talked about before. Let's identify the things that you don't like. Uh, and let's what's simply left? remove them. Exactly. What's and, left? And then you have a whole bunch of empty space. And then you're going to end up filling it with stuff. Yeah. And then let's do the clean out again. Until finally, all we've got is stuff that you like that you're doing. And when that happens, boom, this light goes off. This wow. magic appears. That's and all of a sudden, I feel like, yeah. yeah. This is why I'm here. This is exactly. what I'm good at. Exactly. This is what I enjoy. It's that That's process right. of elimination, knowing what you love is about knowing what you don't love. That's right. What you don't want to do. That's right. All right. When we get back from this final break. You're going to coach me. you take me through that first session? Absolutely. Oh, my God. Here we go, folks. <laughs> get your chair box. I might start crying about my childhood when we get back on This Week in Startups. <laughs> Are you tired of dull and ineffective meetings? Are you tired of everybody not being able to hear each other or see each other? You know how it goes on these calls. People get disengaged. Well, I have the tool that's going to get everybody super engaged, and I use it every week, multiple times a week. And for those of you watching, I'm holding it in my hands. Yes, it's the beautiful, award-winning Meeting Owl Pro. This is the new one. I've been waiting for it. And it's got that 360-degree camera, all these incredible microphones. And you know what it does? This robotic camera zooms in, zip, 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 on whoever's talking. And it can hear you perfectly. So if you're a remote worker, this is the best tool because you're going to have crystal clear audio and sound. And everything works out of the box. There's no special software. It's compatible with every major video platform. Zoom, Skype, Hangouts, Blue Jeans, and more. Over 22,000 companies, think about that, from Fortune 100s to startups like mine, investment firms, are using the meeting out because it makes hybrid teams, which we all have now, and remote workers feel like they're all in one location. We use it, we love it, Thank you so much for making it. Uh, the founders are great. They, they made this product because they needed it themselves. And here's your call to action. I can't believe they're doing this, but they love the podcast. You're going to get 50 bucks off. 5-0, a fitty from me. Your boy, Jay Cow, is giving you 50 bucks off your first meeting out. Visit owl, O-W-L, labs.com slash twist. That's right, O-W-L, labs.com slash twist, owl, labs.com slash twist. And use the offer code twist, as in this week in startups, T-W-I-S-T, at checkout. It's an amazing product. I use it. I love it. It gets my highest recommendation. And if you talk to anybody who uses it, they'll tell you it's a game changer. It's an awesome product. All right, let's get back to this awesome episode. All right, incredible de guest today. Matt Moshari is here. Uh, yeah, he coaches investors like me and CEOs, like the ones I invest in. You do the mid-level managers at all? Like the VPs, the managers, or is that a different type of coach? I have coached executive teams like with, at Clearbit with Alex. Yeah. I basically went in for two months and said, okay, Alex, I'm now going to act as CEO right. and I'm going to run the company. You're going to sit next to me during every meeting and I'll show you what it looks That's like. That's that shadow CEO method? Exactly. Unpack that. What is it? Well, it's literally that. It's one day a week. It's one-on-one -on -one with every VP and then the exec wow. team meeting and then an all hands and then an open office hours. I mean, it's a 12 hour day. It's brutal. Um, and you know, the CEO just sits next to me the whole time to see what it is that I do. And it usually takes about four weeks to sort of implement what I call the system. Hmm. Um, another four weeks for good results to start happening and another four weeks for the company to really just take off. Amazing. So about 12 weeks total. And then at that point, the CEO is like, this is amazing. But the CEO may also say, it's amazing, but I don't want to run that because it's just like a bunch of, it's like a checklist, hmm. just process, 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 process. And oftentimes the CEO is a, a big thinker mm. and a product person and not a process person, right. in which case we just slot someone else in. Right. Um, the problem is it's very effective. The problem is it's, it takes a ton of my time. Right. So I actually don't do that anymore. Huh. Um, and, you know, oh, well. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. That's like the really roll up your sleeves yes. craziness. What does it cost yeah. to have a coach? Like 25 grand a year, 50 grand? I have no idea. A couple thousand a month? I'm free. Wait a second. <laughs> you do you coach twenty five people for free? Yeah, that's not logical. You should get paid. Um, do they give you equity or something? Sam Allman had a great line. He said, "We all should be doing things that we would do for free." Right. And I just took that line one step further and said, "Well, why not actually do it for free?" Wow. And for me, it's actually very selfish because it forces me to put on that filter of, "Do I love this?" And I mean, love it. So if I'm not loving it. It stops right then, right there. 
Like wow. even in this situation, if I right. weren't loving this, yeah, I'd just get up and walk out. Wow. Um, but I'm loving this. I'm loving it too. <laughs> All right, here we go. We're in our first session. We got the document open. We're video chatting. You got referred to me by uh, Alex from Clearbit. He said, Jay Cal is this incredible investor, but he wants to be even better. Yeah. What happens now? Take me through it. Let's All right. do it as if there's nobody else listening. Perfect. Um, so Jason, there's three parts to this, but it gets increasingly interesting. Mm. The second part is more interesting than the first, and the third part is more interesting than the second. So I'm actually with you, I'm gonna go in reverse order. Okay. Because I don't know how much time we actually have. About 15 minutes. Left yeah, we, we, we won't get through all three if we go okay. chronologically. So we're gonna go reverse order. Okay, here we go. So the first thing is feedback. This is the absolute most important thing. All right, get ready, and, Charles and Nick in the control room. Well, for now, it's gonna be me. Okay, great. And so- You've already, we've already had a little bit of interaction here. Yeah. There's already be something at some point that you kind of went, uh, I didn't love that about Matt. I didn't mm -hmm. love that Matt did that. I don't okay. know what it is. Um, I don't want you to tell me. I just want you to think it. Okay. Have that you have that thought? Yeah. And also, by the way, something that if you told me, you're, you, you, you think that it might actually upset me and that I would then not like you. So like, what's the edgiest thing? Okay. Okay, perfect. I got it. You got it? Yeah. Now, can you please tell it to me? I think you not taking to heart what people told you about your weight um, was a bit callous and that you might want to think about the impact you're having on them worrying about you and that it would cost you nothing to, you know, just fast and maybe eat 500 or less calories and drop 10 pounds. And I'm really speaking to myself in this regard because I just lost 15 and I'm trying to lose the last 10. So we're a symbolical on this. <laughs> right but on. I, when you said that, I just it triggered me as well yeah. because I feel like I need to lose the weight because I have people tell me the same thing and I've been trying. Perfect. So first of all, thank you for being willing to say that. Right. Second, I think what I heard you say is that when I got the feedback from all my coaches that I should lose weight, I just said, nah, that was callous and I should really think about the impact on them and on others. Correct. And it would be so, so easy- for me to act on it, that it in the in the grand scheme of things, why not? Why not? Because they care about you and they want you around. And yeah. for you to say like, I don't care what you think, I want to yeah. eat my brisket and I want to have a double serving. That's my priority. I don't believe in living forever. They do want you to live forever. Yeah, and my family as well. Oh, and your family too. Right. So I don't know if that was an actual situation or a, a hypothetical. No, that was. A, that's a very real situation. Right. So, so I'm with your your. Uh, um, the people who gave you that feedback. Perfect. So, I'm on their team. And and I did I did I do you think I understood what you said? That you I understood reflect? it. You reflected it back perfectly because you actually use the same words. Awesome. Yeah. So I've appreciated. I've acknowledged it. Now let's see if I accept it. Right. So I don't want to seem like a flip flopper. Right. Um. But now I accept it. Huh. Here's why. About 30 days ago, I decided. Maybe 40 days ago, I decided on my own just for fun. I would stop eating carbs and sugars and yeah alcohol for a three-day period and after that i played in a weekly sunday soccer game and after and on that third day i went and played the soccer game and i scored three goals i never score goals in this game and it was a lot of fun wow and i thought wow i really enjoyed that feeling yeah so i decided to keep going with it and so like you i've lost 13 pounds in the last 30 days and, and, um, Great. and it, but i'm enjoying it now because yes. now it's it's so i do accept it and i'm going to keep going in this direction uh, again, I'm accepting it because it's now resonating with me. Right. Two, three months ago, it didn't resonate with was me. Was it not resonating with you because you felt a little bit of critique and it was too personal, do you think? No, no, not at all. It was oh. literally, it was a conscious choice. Ah. I want to be doing this. Right. Now, I want to be doing something else. I love it. Um, so I will act on it. And if you even want to, I will report back to you in a month. Cool. Uh, to make so you can see that I actually acted on it. Fantastic. Now I feel great. <laughs> Not that I need you to report back to me, but I just feel good for your friends who care about you and who must have been a little frustrated by you dismissing them. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So that's the first part. Feedback. Got it. That was so, good. That felt good. Right on. So that's half. It felt productive and it felt like so personal because weight is such a personal issue. Right. That it felt particularly uh, cathartic. I awesome. Like to use a word. Awesome. Yeah. And that, so we did half of the feedback. The other half yeah. would be me giving you feedback. Go ahead. And by the way, I'd also tell you what I like that you've done and what I wish that you would do differently. Go ahead. Because it's important to validate the yeah. things that you're doing well. Yeah. And also validate the fact that I value this relationship. Got it. Because you're not going to take feedback from someone who like just 
hates you and sees nothing but negative in you, it's not worth trying to. Yeah, no. It's biased anyway. Exactly. It's loaded. But let's not do the second half. Let's actually go into what would normally be step two, which is the issues that you're facing. Right. And let's unpack them. Sure. So, and this is, I mean, this is going to be more vulnerable for you than for me. Let's do it. Okay. So what's a challenge that's fit you're facing in your life? And a way to think about this is what, when you think about anger or mm. fear, yeah, what thoughts come to mind in your anger life? Anger and fear. Um, I have, I'm trying to think about fear. It's very hard for me to put my finger on fear. I, I fear... Uh, some of my investments that I'm very invested in and I want to see succeed failing. Mm -hmm. It would be heartbreaking for me to have put years of work into them and to watch the founder fail and think maybe I didn't do enough to support that founder. That to me is beyond my own personal failure, which can't happen now because Mm -hmm. like you, I'm post money and I've already hit you know, three or four home runs. It's not about me anymore. It's about that feeling of, gosh, I, I told the world that I think that this could be the next Uber or Robin Hood. It could be the next Calm. And it went to zero. Yeah. That to me, it's just, you know, it's like striking out or or just tell, sending people to a restaurant and telling them this is the greatest one ever and it failed, right? Yeah, yeah. That to me, if I have a fear of anything or anger, I would be angry at myself that I didn't get it over the finish line. And okay. maybe I could have. Okay. What didn't I do? All right. Or why did I pick that one? All right. And bet everything on it. So this is almost like you're anticipating the sadness that you're going to feel. As and you- have felt when things failed, because I've felt it before too. Okay. Yeah. I've but seen is, this, is this really keeping you up? Let, let me ask you a different way. Yeah. I, I'm happy to unpack this one, but this is yeah. very future. And this no, is, no, this is keeping me up right now. There's a So uh, you didn't are, sleep well last night, and this was a thought you had when you woke up. The, over the last couple of weeks, I have been dealing with a couple of companies that have struggled and could face imminent failure. Yeah. Okay. It, it, I wouldn't say it's keeping me up all night, but I wake up and I think about it when I'm having my coffee. Yeah. And I go to bed, I think about it. Yeah. It's a first thing and last thing for sure. Got it. On my mind. Okay. Yeah. So- uh, m- there are several things we can do here, but before I give my yeah. feedback, I'd like you to tell me, well, what do you propose? If you were giving yourself advice, what yeah. advice would you give yourself? Yeah. Uh, ask for help. From what? Let's get specific. Well, ask my peers, other investors, like, how do I save this company or how do I shut it down gracefully or how do I deal with something I made a big bet on not working out? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And I started doing that. Okay. I started calling people and saying, hey, I need help on this one because I don't think this one should die. This one should survive. But originally, the problem you're telling me was fear of what's going to happen, the feeling you're going to have when you have to let people know that these companies die. Yeah, so that's that's preventing some of them, maybe helping some of them. Maybe. It's really the fear of I just watching the founder fail. It's even more like I know the investors can lose their money, and they've made, I've made so much money for other people that it's no big deal. They can afford to lose it. Yeah, it's the failure of me being able to support, get the founder to victory. Perfect. Because okay. I basically gave them the jet fuel to go on the rocket. Perfect. And now the rocket's coming back down, and they didn't make it to orbit. Got it. To okay. use a metaphor. Let me ask one other question. Yeah. What did you do to help create this situation? I mean, you basically just said it. I gave. I put yeah, them on the rocket. I told them they could do it. I yeah. told them, here's the fuel. Hit the button. Let's go. Yeah. Let's try. Yeah. What else did you do? And what do you have to believe for this to be a problem? It sounds like you have to believe that failure is going to be terrible for this founder. Yeah. It's almost, I, I know the founders will succeed and do a second company and I'll invest in them again. Yeah. Which is always my commitment to the founder. Like if we if we do our best- I'll be there for the next company. Yeah. Uh, and I'll help you find a job if you want to do something in between. Uh, you can be an entrepreneur in residence. It's a lot of options like that. But it's more the, the reg- I fear the regret that I didn't do enough. Like waking up one day and saying, oh, fuck, what if I did this? You know, like you, 
you you go back to the game and you're like, I should have thrown the Hail Mary or I could have run this play. I could have made this phone call. Did I do enough? Almost like if I am the coach, did I coach the player to success enough? You know what I'm saying? Yes. And did I give them the right direction? Did I give them bad advice? You know? Yes. Yes. That to me falls on me. This is freaking beautiful. Okay. Because Jason, you're bringing it full circle. Yeah. This is you. Yeah. Experiencing imposter syndrome. Right. And this is you also being gripped by fear. Yeah. Because in the very beginning of this podcast, you introduced it by saying, hey, failure is a part of being a founder. And you know right. what? You move on, you'll succeed in your next one. Right. And you get the right to start again. And you painted a very rosy picture right. of failure. And it sounded very compelling to me. And it sounded very true to me because yes. that's the experience I've had and I've seen with others. Right. And yet now in this situation, you're thinking, oh my God, it's this big tragedy. And it's really all about me not doing enough and me not being good enough. Right. And where, whereas that is fear gripping you and taking you yes. literally from... 30 minutes ago when you weren't gripped by fear right. to now in a place where you are gripped by fear and right. the same situation describing completely differently. Right. So I would ask you to vision with each of these companies, let's imagine that it actually does fail. Yeah. And then I, and this, you're going to have to do this on your own. We're not going to yeah. have time to do this now, but I would take a good 30 minutes and go slowly. The next thing, the first thing to do is they run out of cash and then they have to lay off the employees and then the founder the has assets. to send out an email yeah. and then you have to have the conversation with the founder or founder really calls you and then, and walk through each step along the way and what you're going to do to go help that founder start again right. and walk it all the way through till the end. And when that founder either comes back or doesn't come back and then come back to me and see how you feel. Right. But my guess is just experiencing the reality right. would be like you walking into those houses in Brooklyn, yeah. or apartments in Brooklyn and go, I feel fear, but I can't stop. Now I'm in it. Yeah. And it's fine. Right. It all works out. It all works fine. out. Fine. Yeah. It's would you just, be willing to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it, it, I've had moments where I told myself like, hey, listen, you're built for this. You're the Jedi in this situation. You're, you're the Jedi master. You can just walk into any situation and you got the lightsaber, and hey, you may lose an arm, but they can put one of those, you know, Luke Skywalker got that metal arm. So I have the metaphor in my mind of how to deal with it. So it, that's why it's not keeping me up at night. But, you know, the fear of them, just me not doing enough makes me want to do more. And I, you know, I try to channel that fear into just doing a little bit more. So I feel like I gave it my all. Okay. Because to me, that is my, always my regret you know, when I look back on my career, did I actually give it my all? Did I actually leave it all out on the field? Right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like even after this interview, there'll be a moment in time when I'll say, I'll be driving home and go, fuck, I had a great question. I didn't ask it. You know? And that always burns me a little bit. But And, and so yeah. what then I'll leave you with is there's always two ways we can look at any situa situation in life and in the world. Yeah. It's all about the question we ask. If we ask what's wrong with this situation, what didn't I do well enough? Right. What could I have, what, how, how was I inadequate? Right. We will always come up with an answer huh. and then we will focus on that answer and then we will drive towards sadness and negative feeling. Huh. But if we simply flip the question and say, what's right about this situation? What's right about the fact that I had this great question that he didn't ask? Right. Oh, now I get to ask it later on. Right. I get Part a follow two. up. Exactly. Yeah. I have back an on excuse the pod. to reach up back out to Matt. Yeah. And there will also always be answers to the question of what's right with this situation. But if we ask that question, then all of a sudden we think about what's right. And all of a sudden we start feeling joy and exuberance yeah. and bliss. So it really is back to what question do we ask ourselves? So I would encourage you to ask every situation that you encounter hmm. that frustrates you, angers you, you feel fear about. Ask yourself, what's right about this situation? What's good about it? Right. And so I ask you right now, what's good about some of your companies are going to fail? What's good about that? Well, there was such a big prize and such a, a meaningful potential victory that to not have tried would have been worse to have tried. So that to me is always something that I think about because so many people I know talk but don't try. So many people I know meet with the company, but don't write the check. Mm -hmm. And I always take pride in taking my own counsel 
and backing the companies that to many people seem like a fool's errand. You know, mm -hmm. Calm was one of those where they met with 80 investors or something like that. They got 80 no's. And I was like maybe the 81st and I said yes and it worked out. So for me, those are the most rewarding is when I make the contrarian bet, when I make the bet that everybody else is afraid to make. I introduced Uber to 22 investors at that Open Angel Forum, the event where Travis pitched and only three of us said yes. And I get to see those other 19 investors and all 19 when I see them say, I should have listened to you. I was an idiot. Oh my God, how did you see it? I, I couldn't see it. How did you see it? And, and that risk taking is kind of my skill, I think, is to take the bet, to gamble, you know? And it's, it is, the good in it is that if you take that risk, if you consistently take that risk, man, does it pay off, you know? The ones that do succeed are such outliers that, the contrarian bets are the ones that make your career, right? My two best now are a cab company and a meditation app. You know, like if I told you as investors, like, you know, in 10 years, my cab company and my meditation app are going to define my career. It's like, are you delusional? Like it's not enterprise <laughs> software. It's not a search engine. It's not a social network. It's right. not a e-commerce site. It's like, no, it's a meditation app and a cab company. Right. And, th and that's what's good for you in yeah. this situation. What's good for the founder who fails that you backed and gave the jet fuel to and made them feel like he could succeed or she could succeed? Oh, my God. Now they have all those battle scars and all that experience. The next time, they're going to just run up the hill and crush it. They can't make those mistakes again. They've been burned in. Perfect. Yeah. There's Perfect. more good than there's bad. That's for sure. Right on. And so that's the way to process it. That actually makes me feel a lot better. Awesome. All right. Thanks for the free session. <laughs> this is my way of scamming myself into a free mentoring session how do you pick they're all free i know i can't believe that how do you pick who to coach yeah and how do you who do you fire who do you not take on i'm just curious um so the, the maybe so an example the, the, would be good yeah the longer story is that um i was coaching again these um young guys out of stanford and that's who i thought that yeah. i only could coach and then one day one of them introduced me to my first sort of celebrity CEO, a guy named Naval Ravikant, who started AngelList. And Naval, you were Naval's coach. Yeah, oh, that's a good friend of mine. Yeah, Naval's a great guy. Amazing. And uh, he came over to my house. We sat down. We spent about ninety minutes together. And there's this problem that had been sort of plaguing him for a decade. And in the in that ninety minutes, we not only unpacked it, but we came up with a roadmap. And six weeks, we implemented the roadmap. And six weeks later, problem completely solved. Wow. And life, you know, magically better, amazing. And he turned to me and he said. Matt, I know everybody. I know all the coaches out there. You're the best in the world. And wow. I thought, that's crazy. That's impossible. But I thought, okay, well, if it is true, then I should be able to coach whoever I want. So I made up a list of 20 people. And these are the people that I like to coach. are all in San Francisco, all the people that sort of I admire, respect. And I said, well, do you know anyone on this list? He said, yeah, I know Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. I said, great. Can you please introduce me? He did. I started coaching Brian. After a few months when I created trust and, and – uh, and like with, with Brian, I said, do you know anyone on the list? He said, yeah, I know Sam Altman. So he introduced me to Sam. Love and Sam. Sam's awesome. Sam and I play cards together sometimes. Right on. And, uh, and after a few months with Sam, again, trust and like created, I said, Sam, do you know anyone on this list? He said, I know all of them. Yeah. And so he introduced me. Now, I don't coach all 20, but I coach about 10 out of that 20 person You made list. the list. See, you did what you're doing with me. You said, hey, make the list. Absolutely. And then you executed on the list. That's exactly you right. You weren't afraid to ask for help either. That's right. That's critical. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. That's how I, I did it. I feel bad about my relationship with Naval because I left AngelList because we nego he doesn't like to negotiate. Right. Like he, he just wants to have one deal with everybody. And I'm like a hardcore negotiator. And we were like real partners and friends. And I was the first syndicate on AngelList. And then I left and I kind of feel like, you know, we never really hung out after that. And I kind of felt bad about it because I kind of like him a lot, but he's a little bit reclusive and like introverted and I'm like way out there and extroverted. But we used to have these great conversations where we talked and then I'm like, hey, come on the pod. And he's like, I'm not doing podcasts anymore. That's true. And he's, he's not. not doing podcasts anymore. I know. I, I think feel the bad. last one he did was the Joe Tim Rogan. or Joe Rogan. Exactly. T yeah. He did Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan. But that doesn't mean he doesn't like you or want to hang out with you. And even if he doesn't have time, because most time he's in Bali or Tulum or- Yeah. Or- um, but here's my recommendation. Yeah. That you just ping him and just say hello. Yeah. And just say, I'm I should do that. I'm thinking, you know what? Your name came up today, Naval. I was thinking about you and it brought back, it was fun for me to think about you. 
That's it. Let's see how he responds. All right. I bet you this is, well, what's your prediction? How will he respond? Uh, good question. Uh, I think he would say, I, I hope you're doing well and your family's great. Um, cause you know, we, we've had dinner, our wives and stuff like that. And, you know, but you know, he's a busy guy. I think everybody wants to get, you yeah. know, it's one of the things with these busy guys and gals is everybody wants to get something from them. Yes. I don't want to get anything from anybody. Like I'm good right. friends with Tim Ferriss. Right. And Tim did a podcast with Jerry and he was just like, everybody wants something from me. I can't take it anymore. There's just too much inbound. Yeah. And I texted him and I was like, you know, I rattled my brain because we've been friends for a long time. I hope I've never asked you for anything. I don't think I've had other than to invite you on the podcast, which you did, which I was grateful for, but I'm not one of those people. And he was like, no, you're not. Can I call you? I need help with these three things. And then we talked on the phone for two or three hours over the last two or three months. And I kind of rekindled my friendship with Tim talking about a couple of things that we both have in common that we both needed to kind of, uh, what's the word? We had to like sort of game theory, a couple of issues that we both uh, were in simpatico on. And it was nice to kind of like rekindle it and also realize that I'm not a burden to him. Like I hate to be, a, that's the other thing. I hate to be a burden to important people. Like, like you, I have a lot of people who've become very successful in my orbit. And then you become a super router for people who want to get something. So everybody wants me to introduce them to Elon or Mark Cuban or Travis or Tim or whoever or Naval. I, I don't want to invite any. I don't want to interrupt those people from their work, you know? But you can always do the double opt-in method. Which is simply I do. Reach in and say, hey, you know, Tim, do you, here's an email. Do you want to meet this person? If yeah. that's great, if not, no problem. I don't no even problem. like to do that. Because I, I feel like it takes up cognitive energy of uh, like a Tim Ferriss or something like that. But anyway, I, I, I get those emails all the time and yeah. I don't mind them. You don't. As okay. long as it's double opt in. Here's yeah. what I hate. Oh, yeah. Hey, C Matt. CC me on the email with the person who wants the introduction. Exactly. Now I've got to go through mental gymnastics of how to say yeah. no. And yeah. Yeah. Nice yeah. to meet you. Pot. Right. Uh, all right. Well, I've got 200 investments, but half of them need a coach. <laughs> unfortunately, so, not unfortunately, not you. <laughs> right, this is what right. happens though. Good coaches get filled up. Their dance yeah. card gets filled so quick. That's exactly right. Yeah. But one last thing on the Naval yeah. thing. So there was a little bit of your prediction is he'd be like, yeah, you know, how you doing? Great. Yeah. Good to hear from you. Um, sort of a neutral response. Yeah. Uh, that That is, I think, your fear talking. Fear yeah. of rejection, the sort of the sadness that you have about the relationship you had before. Yeah. And I, I predict the opposite or I predict much more positive. Oh, okay. I predict that he will go, wow, Jason, great to hear from you. Thanks so much for reaching out. Just wonderful to, to hear you oh. and think about you. Oh, I'm going to give you a shot. So that's our bet. Okay. I got the bet. Yeah. <laughs> I said A, you said B. Exactly. You're always right on these things. So well, maybe we'll it's my fear talking. <laughs> right I'm not a, I, I am and not And I, of course, could game fear. the system and tell Naval to give you that reaction, but I'm not going to. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Let's actually do it. Let's do it as a real A-B test. Well, listen, exactly. Matt, thanks for coming on the pod. I know you're busy and there's no reason for you to come on because you're not looking for new customers and you don't charge. Um, but uh, I just thought- so, you know, 200,000 people listen to every episode and founders are going through this stuff and giving them at least a little, you know, idea of how to release the pressure and understand that none of this is fatal. You That's know, we right. see suicides of entrepreneurs and that is the craziest thing, isn't it? Like yeah. for a founder to kill themselves over the failure of their business yeah. is the biggest tragedy in the world. Absolutely. It's crazy. We've had two founders who've been on the podcast. I don't know if it's the law of big numbers. But you know we've had probably fourteen hundred guests on this podcast and eleven hundred episodes, and um, the founder of EcoMom and the founder of Cambrian Technologies, uh, both of them committed suicide when their businesses failed, and mm. I, it, it haunts me to this day, mm. having sat across the table from them and heard their vision, that these two beautiful souls would just uh, Jody Sherman uh, and. Uh, Founder of Cambrian Analytica, uh, Cambridge Analytica, no, not Cambridge Analytica, Cambrian Analytica, will come to me in a minute. But uh, to just think that a founder in this despair would kill themselves. Right. Well, to feel that much pain, that much pain, that much shame, that much, you know, self hatred. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. never. That is one thing I can never understand: is suicide. Right. And it, I, I talked to a friend of mine about, it and they said, "Listen, you, it's a disease. You you can't understand a disease. You understand cancer. You understand why cancer kills people. I'm right. like, kind of don't. Right. Nobody really does exactly understand it. And it's just yeah. But you uh, see but, people but, get pushed to that point. I'm assuming like that absolutely level of despair. And, and also the sort of this Austin suicide. Hines. Yes, thank you. The, the suicide is actually the the thoughts are very common. I, I ask this often in a group. Uh, How many people here? have thought at one point about suicide because I do this thing also in groups to to create connection. Ah, yes. I ask people to tell 
a and to get over this fear is to tell a thought that or an action or thought that they've had about which they feel shame ah. and to share it with the group. Yeah, that'll create And a to bond. see how the group reacts. Of yeah. course, they're predicting that the group will hate them. Right. But of course, that's not what happens. No, then they get massive sympathy, empathy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and one thing- them forever. One thing that almost always comes up is, I've thought about killing myself. Yeah. And so then I asked the rest of the group, who here has thought about killing himself? And it's always between 30 and 50% of the group has had suicidal thoughts, including Crazy. me, by the way. When yeah. I was 20 and 21, just got out of college and I, you know- got fired from my first job and had no idea what to do and was drifting and felt right. completely useless after having graduated from, you know, one of the best universities in the world. I thought I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm, I'm broken. Mm. And, uh, but then life goes on as you yeah. say, and life doesn't yeah. end. It's amazing how people think is important when they're young. That's they, right. they get so caught up in thinking that that job was important and that job was the least important thing that ever happened to you That's exactly in all likelihood. Right. That's exactly right. It's just yes. insane. Ke yes. Tim Ferriss on this podcast uh, just confessed because I was like, you know, you, you seem like such a positive person. He said, yeah, no, that's that's not correct. And he said, actually, you know, I, I have depressing thoughts and I get melancholy and I actually thought about killing myself. And he says this in a, a live episode of This Week in Startups. And then he wrote a blog post about it because somebody who was in the audience came up to him and said, I was thinking of killing myself. And then I, I saw you on the podcast and I talked to uh, you know, whoever about it and it kind of saved my life because at that moment in time, I was having this moment that you have when you're 21 and Tim Ferriss wrote a blog post about it. And now if you Google suicide thoughts or whatever, he's in the first page of Google wow. explaining when he had suicidal thoughts when he was in college yeah. and how he got through them. Yeah. All right, Matt. Um, I'll see you. Uh, we'll we'll do some brisket. We'll do the awesome. brisket off, I'll, or maybe you make the brisket. I'll make the, the the beef ribs, and we'll just we'll pound it out. Sounds great. Yeah, add five pounds, and then we'll fast for three days and go play soccer. Perfect. Uh, this has been an amazing episode. Thank you to Charles and Nick on the ones and the twos, and thank you to uh, Matt for uh, ringing the bell and making sure the money comes in for the advertisers. Thanks to the advertisers and sponsors, and thanks to Alex McCaw uh, of Clearbit, episode nine nine six. If you missed it for suggesting we have Matt on. Great job. Everybody go read The Great CEO Within. You can get it on Amazon. And uh, thanks again for coming on the pod. Thank you, Jason. This was fun. See you all next time. Bye-bye.